to eight inches, I think. Um, I've never seen one eight inches in length, but the biggest I've seen was about six and a half inches that we caught in the wild here in Miami. I believe either Richard Gaskella, who has retired, has that, or uh, our commissioner, our ex-commissioner, uh, Adam Putnam has it. I can't remember which one ended up with that. Um, research has shown that these uh, snails can lay up to 2,000 eggs per year. And we know that they can reproduce those eggs when they feel threatened or uh, come into a, a situation where they know they're about to be eaten or, or to die. <clears throat> they also carry, um, I don't know, probably butcher this, but it's Andreostrungulitis cantoneus, which is rat lungworm, which causes a form of meningitis that is uncurable. And uh, we know that's uh, prevalent in uh, Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands, and I'm sure they have it in Latin America as well. <clears throat> So back in Miami of 1969 uh, was Florida's first detection. And that was brought in from uh, Hawaii, a young boy that went and visited or had a vacation in Hawaii, brought back three of those snails. And uh, the grandmother, from the research that I found, the grandmother threw them out into the yard and uh, it took approximately seven years to eradicate. I think they collected about 18,000 snails and cost around $1 million uh, 1969 money, which I'm sure was quite a bit back then. The next detection, which, uh, which I, I was involved in from the very beginning was in Miami again, uh, 2011 to 2000, or 2021. We ended up with 31 cores. 30 of those were here in Miami Dade and one in Broward uh, inside Davy city limits. So some stats from that, we had 719 positive properties. Uh, we did over 240,000 core surveys. That's everything within the core, uh, repeated surveys. And then outside the core, over 56,000 surveys. Performed over 102 control actions, that's treatments. And the number of snails collected, I think was well over 168,000. That's just what we counted in the early days. We put them in buckets, brought them in and did not count those. And debris removal is 4.2 million pounds, which is very vital to get this treatment on the ground. So the snails will get to the treatment and die. At the height of the program, we had 92 employees, it, which was about 752,000 labor hours and quarantine acres was over 27,000 and non-quarantine or non-core survey acres. I'm sorry, it was over 14,000. At the time we had two canines on program for snail detection and that totaled about 5,400 of those canine inspections. Currently today, we have three programs in operation. Um, the first one is Pasco County, which was on June 21st, 2022. Uh, currently, we have 47 positive properties, 193 properties in the treatment grids. That was detected by a master gardener that gave that sample to UF Ipus Dade City, who then contacted us. And then we uh, confirmed those snows and the inspector went out and collected 39 on the first day. I'll have some more numbers on these as we go. After that, Lee County came up on December 16th. I remember that day, it was a Friday. Thought we was gonna have a good weekend. Well, a DPI helpline came in, an image came in and Matt Brody, our supervisor in Lee County went out there, confirmed it to be uh, giant African land snails, collected one live and two dead. And currently today, we're still at three positive properties and 54 properties in the treatment grid. And again, Broward County. We actually have two cores in Broward County. We have a core three and a core four. And those were detected on June 1st of 2023. In core three, we have currently have five positive properties, 47 in the treatment grid. Core four has eight positive properties and 66 properties in the treatment grids. The good thing is, is those have not expanded very much since they started. And, you know, that's what we look for is we're trying to keep those snails contained in the one area so they don't get spread and, and keep adding properties onto our, our treatment grids. 
So here's the stats for Pasco, Lee, and Broward. And these are current as of last week. We performed over 5,700 surveys in Pasco, over 4,900 treatments. Last live snow was on 8-4-23, and the last dead is 8-22-23. And the reason why I mentioned dead is that plays a vital part in the eradication as well as the live snow. And I'll try to explain that in a little more depth as we go. Lee County, we're at 1,200 surveys, a little over 700 treatments. Last live was on March 10th, 23, and the last dead on 8-28-23. Broward. Now these are combined totals, um, surveys over 2,000, over 700 treatments. Again, last live back in August 3rd of 2023 and the last dead was on 8-30-23. And when I say last dead, that means recently dead. The snails do decay pretty rapidly when they die from the heat and humidity or the ants or whatever that eats them. So when I say last dead, they have to have some type of flesh in the in the shell and that's very vital to our decommissioning process so we have many many departments that play in this uh, they play a very vital role in our eradication efforts as you can see we have survey and control uh, we have our outreach regulatory diagnostics and methods so survey and control they're the hands the feet on the ground they they do all the hard labor work it's very intensive they, they actually go out and knock on doors, get the waivers. They, they uh, talk to homeowners. They do the survey. They do the treatment, debris removal. They'll do a night, what we call a night survey, which is really an evening survey. They also do um, the rain events. If it's raining, we'd like to get out there, especially in the afternoon if it's raining, because that's when those snows are most active and try to see what we can find while it is raining. They assist our canines on getting on properties and in other areas such as illegal dump sites where canines can only do so much and then they'll go in there and dig through illegal dump sites to see if they can find the smells. For outreach, we've done bus benches, television ads, um, movie theaters. Uh, I haven't been to the movies in probably 15 years, but my understanding at the beginning of every movie, they have these little trailers like sections and outreach put like a one or one and a half minute uh, section up for giant African land snails here in Miami. They said that was a very good outreach tool. We do community community events. We put up billboards, mall ads, uh, especially where malls are heavily uh, trafficked or uh, have heavy traffic from local personnel or local um people here and then you know a lot of printed materials and we do a lot of elementary school events as well if, if they uh, choose to have us there. Regulatory, our regulatory group really consists of our John African land snail personnel as well as plant inspection personnel. And, and, and it is a heavy load with everything that's going on. So we, we have to have this outside help from plant inspection to help us with regulatory events. And, and really it's just to get compliance agreements signed from stock dealers, nurseries, lawn and landscapers, and utility companies. So they're aware that they shouldn't be moving material in a quarantine zone. And uh, if they do, they need to contact us so we can either witness it or inspect it before removal. And that sometimes gets dropped by the wayside because we're just stretched so thin and shorthanded. We have our diagnostics lab. They do identification, DNA, and they do our testing for a rat lung. <clears throat> and our methods, uh, they, they really do the work I don't want to do, and that's uh, get us our special local needs labels and work with our AES department. And they test new products and, and there's not many products out on the market for us. We, we wanna move away from our metallohyde-based products and try to get something more environmentally friendly. And it's just so difficult right now that uh, the only thing on the market's iron phosphate. Tested that not too long ago. They had a 4% iron phosphate. I bought some, sent it up to them. The snails walked on it, danced on it, ate it, and, and it just slowed them down, but never did kill them. So, we're, I'm constantly looking for anything to help us get away from any metallohyde-based products. 
Again, our survey crews, like I said, it's the feet on the ground. They are the heavy lift. They do, they do all the hard labor work and moving material out in the field. As you can see in this slide, you know, they're, they're up in the plants and they, uh, like you see in that one picture, they move the, the plywood out of the way because the snails will get under there during the heat of the day and, and especially neonates so they don't dry out. So I, my hat's off to them. Like I said, there's a lot that they do and a lot of them enjoy it. And the ones that don't, they go down the road and find something else. But uh, I'm really proud of that group. And uh, other things that they have to do or assist with is what we call ag warrants. So if we have properties that are refusals or a hard no, we don't want you here and they're within the treatment grid, we will give them three chances. We make three attempts to get them on board. After the third attempt, I will go to Ag Law. They write the affidavit. They serve the Ag Warrant and our inspectors go on and do the um, survey and treatment. Right now, I can only, I got four warrants in process, one in Pasco, one in Lee, and two in Broward. I hate to go that route, but sometimes we have to. I, I try to educate the homeowner as much as possible, let them make the decision and try to give them enough chances to let us do our job. Debris removal. Like I said, debris removal is very vital to the treatment. This is a property right off the Clusahatchee River in between condos and the orange buildings in the back is a rehab facility. And to the left of that is the Clusahatchee River. That is actual debris that came in from uh, Hurricane, what was the one that we just had? Not the, the one before, Ida uh, or whatever it was. I can't remember the name of that hurricane, but Ian, I'm sorry, Hurricane Ian. Um, sorry about that. Um, so that debris was all over that property and that is a positive property. So we went in and we take our tractor, we put it all in a pile. If we can double bag it, we will. But piles like this, we actually load it into a dump truck and cover it, and it is transported to an incinerator and incinerated immediately. But before that, it was unsafe for our crews to walk and uh, get the job done. You know, you got you got all kind of debris in the way. They're tripping. They're in a hazard. And if we had a K-9, we could not let that K-9 enter that property, not knowing what was there. We've had properties where they've had thousands of needles, um, where somebody has dumped needles off from who knows where. We've had broken glass, uh, cans that are been cut and razor sharp. You name it, we've probably seen it. We've collected weapons. Um, you, it can go on, the list just keeps going on. But uh, that's why when we have a property like this, we clean it just so we basically safety for the crew and the dogs and to get the treatment on the ground where the snails are at. So for control activities, we have a process that we have to follow, which is in department to rule 5B67. It states before we do any control actions, we have to notify the public and we do so through a newspaper, but we usually establish that quarantine first. We write up the quarantine, give it to our PIO officer who then puts it in the newspaper and then we're allowed to start treatment 24 hours afterwards. But before all, even after that, we knock on the doors, get our waivers. The day before we drop that yellow notice that you see hanging up on the top right there that tells them we're gonna do survey treatment. It has a number of boxes we check of what we're planning to do. We put that notice on the door handle if they're not home, letting them know that the next day we'll be there to do a survey, a survey and treatment, or just a treatment depending on the status. And we ask them to leave their gates unlocked if they feel safe to do so. If not, they can contact us. We'll come back when they're available, whether it be a weekend, an evening, a holiday, whatever it takes, so we can get on that property and get the job done. <clears throat> and then after that, we put in a yard sign required by law after the treatment. And that sign has a little tag on it that we date and put the time on the REI, which is 12 hours. So right after we treat it, we put that sign up with the date and time and then we're done. And then the next day after the 12 hours, 
If our crews are still in the area, we go back and collect those signs. And the reason is we had such a hard time, I think it's due to COVID, of getting those signs and those sticks. So we made a decision to go back and collect them if they're still there so we can put them back in rotation. And uh, when we're just now at the point where we can get a good inventory of signs in. So, and a lot of people come out and remove them. Right after we leave, we've seen them come out, take them and throw them in the trash. And that's up to them. Um, it's what they want, that's what they can do. So some of our control equipment is like you see here, the hand sprayer on the right and then the push spreader on the left. Um, those are preferred. We tried a number of other types of equipment and it just didn't work. And this is what we ended up with for hand treatments. Here you have our sprayers. Uh, we had a pump up sprayer, but the guys didn't like it. So we, I bought them a battery operated one, trying to make their life a little easier. And then on the left there, you'll see our little 50 gallon spray that we mix the liquid in. We don't use these too often, but uh, we've had, had, had to use a 200 gallon sprayer before up on the railroad tracks here in Miami because the area was so big. Um, we had to put that in the back of a truck and then walk and do the treatments with that uh, big sprayer around a recycling plant. And then we use our backpack blower. This one can do both pellets and liquid. We only do pellets in it and that's to get up under the sheds, uh, the uh, TED sheds that you see on blocks. So smells love to go under there. And so we blow the pellets under there and then hard to get to places like between fences or under some houses where we're at are raised. So you blow it up under there. Um, Otherwise, when you try to get on your hands and knees and throw it under there by hand, it just doesn't go as far. So we, we uh, come up with this and purchase that and uh, seems to be working very well. Our newest tool, one that I love dearly, is our Skag uh, Turf Storm. We bought one of these to see how it would do on our larger properties and it works so well, we actually bought two of them. We have one in Pasco and one in Lee County. Uh, I think we got them for just around $12,500 each. Oh, sorry about that. My computer wants to do its own thing. So what I like about these, the hopper holds up to about 150 pounds of product. On each side, it has a 30 gallon tank. So a total of 60 gallons that you can split the tank. So if we wanted to do herbicide in one and slug fest in the other, we can keep them separated. Uh, we did upgrade it to a 200 PSI pump. So we can, uh, we have some wooded areas and we, we roll off in there as far as we can. And then we unreal the hose and, and spray back there and we needed the extra pressure because it only came with like a 75 pound pump and it was not quite enough to get where we wanted. Another feature of this is it has a folding boom sprayer in the front. You can fold that boom out on each side and uh, have a wider treatment area. We have not used that yet, but uh, I'm sure it'll come in somewhere. Hopefully not, but I'm sure it will play a role somewhere down the road. Empty weight of this is only about 900 pounds, which makes it easy to load and transport. And uh, I just love the machine. I, like I said, we got two. That's actually Jason Stanley on it now. He, he's actually spraying water, so don't don't be terrified. He's not in, <laughs> in his uh, long sleeve shirt and got his glasses on. But uh, he it's, it's hard to get him off the machine when he's around me, so I let him drive it when he wants. Um, so going back a little bit, back in the history of the mollusca sites, back in 1969, they used arsenate and uh, metaldehyde in seven. Well, we know arsenate is no longer on the uh, shelf anymore, and I don't think they had too good of a luck with seven because we never used it on the Miami program. And then on 2011 and 2021, 20, we started out with iron phosphate. And we had very little kill ratio with it. It was really bad. And we bought a lot of iron phosphate, put out a lot of iron phosphate. People loved it because they said their grass was getting greener, but it was just not working for us. Neither did the boric acid. We didn't do as much with boric acid, but it didn't seem to do very well either. 
And then the metaldehyde came into play and it was very successful. And that's what we use in Pasco Lee and now in Broward as well. So the four products that we use and the two main ones are the, are the Orcal Slug and Snail Bait, which is 3.25% metaldehyde. And then we use the Deadline Ornamental and that's a 4% metaldehyde. Those are our two go-to. That's the ones we keep in stock at all times. They both have bittering agents. Uh, the Orcal is grayish in color and the Deadline is reddish in color. And what I was told by the vendor was that the the reddish color is supposed to prevent wildlife from eating it. The grayish has um, the bittering agent uh, called, oh God, what was it called? It's called Bitrix. And that is to keep animals from eating it as well, or dogs, cats. and and uh, But we don't really put enough out to do any harm that I know of to any dogs or cats. Now the Orcal Slugfest bottom right hand corner is a liquid that's 25%. It's used for targeted sprays, such as under the sheds or in, a infestated, in an area that has a large infestation and we see a lot of eggs and neonates. That is a quick knockdown for us and we only do it within a couple, two, three feet of that area. And we make sure that there's no pets in the yard when we put that out. It does dry really fast and breaks down within 12 hours. All three of these have a 12 hour entry uh, period. Now the Dura metaldehyde granular, that's 7.5%. It's like a sand base. It's another quick knockdown. Um, we use that as well as uh, another high infestated area where there's a lot of neonates or juveniles and it gets really down into the thatch of the grass really deep in there. So again, we try to not use those two as any more than we have to, but we do keep them in stock just in case. And uh, yes, I have had to use them several times up in Pasco. <clears throat> and like I said, all four, do have a 12 hour REI. So a little bit about our regulatory. Um, as, there, as everybody knows, we're, we're all shorthanded with personnel. So regulatory kind of takes a back seat to survey and treatment and debris removal, but we still go out and do our compliance agreements. We try to sign up utility companies that are out there putting in power poles or running underground utilities through the quarantine area. We uh, if there's any stock dealers in the area, we sign them up. Um, uh, lawn and landscapers, we, we try to talk to every one of those and sign them up as well. And if there's any transfer stations in the area, we'll sign them up. And we do try to, to, uh, to do a inspection on the transfer stations at least once a month. The CAs um, just basically say that uh, you're not going to, you're going to report any snails or noxious weeds that you run across and that you're going to keep records of any treatments that you perform. And if you sell any product and we, let's say we go out to a neighborhood and we find out that this product come from a nursery within a quarantine area, they can provide us the, the information we need to other people that bought the product. So we can do a follow-up inspection as well. <clears throat> So thank God for data. Um, back when Miami started, we, we didn't really have a system in place to collect data and surveys and treatments and, there, and every, all the other things that we did on these programs. So we kind of started from scratch with paper, with paper and then uh, went to a, a database which uh, was access and that started getting to where it would fail us a lot. So we went to Esri and I give a lot of credit to Callie Walker who helped get this on board and get it started. But everything now is collected through a tablet and uh, it's real time data. And that's using an Esri ArcGIS platform. So our, our inspectors, each as aspect of this program from survey to regulatory activities, treatment, debris removal, all that has its own separate app. So they log in, click on that app, record whatever it is they're doing, how much treatment they put out. It records 
the time that they put it out and how much. And then uh, we have what we call dashboards and that's what you're seeing here. So what you're seeing is the Pasco County dashboard. So we can run reports and that helps us make a decision on color of what property this property needs to be. All properties start out with a color. So those colors play a vital part on how we do surveys, treatments and decommissioning. And uh, we can run reports off of this and it helps us make management decisions a lot quicker and get our teams where they need to be if uh, we need them in another area of those treatment grids. So as I was talking about eradication and the decommissioning process, every property must have a minimum of 30 surveys and 26 treatments. That's everything. And then it changes from red or gray to another color, which is yellow, which I'm sorry, guys, my laptop wants to do its own thing today. Then it turns to a yellow, and then from there it goes to green and then blue. And I got a slide for that, but what you see here is every property has to have a at least one detector dog visit and one night survey in order to meet the commission. So <clears throat> with that said, this chart right here <laughs> creates a lot of headache when we go to the, to the decommission table because what we do is we want to make sure our red and grays meet this criteria that they follow from red to gray to yellow to green to blue. And then after that, the yellow follows this criteria, as you can see, uh, that's every 30 days for eight months. And then once that's met, turns to green for seven months. That's two surveys at 90 days apart. And then you have two surveys when it turns blue that are 180 days apart. And they, they got to meet that night survey and detector dog survey. So what consists of a decommission team? Well, it's usually a science officer such as uh, uh, Dr. Mary Grant, uh, Mary uh, Yong Kong. Um, then we have usually two or three USDA staff and then up to four FDAX personnel from various parts of the division. They could be from methods. It could be, uh, could be one of our admin people, but we try to get somebody from each department to help us on this. And then we sit down and review this chart. And before we go into the room, we make sure we understand the chart that we're all on board. And then once that's completed, every property is looked at one by one to make sure it has met its criteria. And they analyze everything from how many snails live and dead to the last live, to the last dead, how many treatments, how many pounds. And it's, it's a process that takes sometimes days. But when we're done, everybody's satisfied, we sign off and move on. So this is a slide I got from Jason Stanley, who was supposed to give this talk today, and I won't spend a lot of time on it because I'm not real uh, keen on these phenotypes or differences. But through the years, as you can see, back in 1969, the Hawaii uh, snails, they had a uh, dark brown flesh. And then in, and then, um, in Miami and Lee, they had this uh, grayish brown flesh and then up in Pasco is the white creamy color flesh. My understanding that uh, white creamy flesh is from the islands and it's very well known in the pet trade. So um, we did a lot, of, a, a lot of research up there, went door to door talking to people and we, we can never find out how this snow made it to Pasco and we probably never will such as any other snails that's come in, except for the one in Hawaii in 1969, where the person admitted they brought them in from Hawaii. So as you know, um, John African land snails can carry the rat lung nematode. And uh, this is another slide that uh, Jason Stanley provided. And um, my understanding is the snails will eat the rat feces. And then, and I got another slide here. I was looking for something that I had, but I couldn't find it, but I found this on CDC website. So I put it in here. As you can see, the rat is a host and then drops its feces where the snail will eat the feces. 
and either the rat eats the snail or the human picks up the snail and then uh, can contract the uh, rat lung nematode, which can make its way to the brain. And uh, I've only known of one person that has gotten sick with the uh, meningitis here in Miami and they claim that the, that person has not made a full recovery, but doing well. I don't know the full story, so I don't want to give you false hope that she did make a, ref a full recovery. But uh, uh, my understanding is that she did handle a snail and the tip was cut off for a ritual and she sucked the juice out and that's when she became sick a few days later. So um, my, my best wishes for her that she is doing well these days. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, we... Uh, we always talk about protection through detection and our, our division is always out looking and doing surveys, whether it be for snails, weeds, um, flies, you name it. We're, we're trying to get out there and uh, get our hands on it first and try to keep it controlled before the spread. So, but if anybody has any questions, you can also call that number at the bottom, that 888-397-1517, that's our hotline. You can talk to them or even drop them an email, or you can just get a hold of me at that cell phone number or my email address, and I'll do my best to get with you and uh, talk to you about whatever your concerns are. Or if you think you have anything, we'll get somebody out there to collect it. If you have any questions, I open the floor. Thank you very much, Rusty. That was really great. Um, we do have one question already. Okay. So do any animals eat the snails? Um, and kind of continuing on that, does the metaldehyde um, affect wildlife? Well, I've, let me put it this way. Yes, we do have, I won't say ant, we do, I have seen birds eat neonates. And, and I say birds like I'm talking about ibises and chickens especially chickens. I don't know why they like the, the neonates. Maybe it's a soft shell that they can crush and, and get that protein. I'm not sure. Now, as far as metaldehyde, um, I've treated chicken areas and never had a chicken get sick that I know of. I've always told the property owners when we're treating so they can keep an eye on chickens. Now, I've had people tell me their dog's gotten sick. We've had them take them to the vet and it's always some other something else other than metaldehyde. Um, a lot of it's usually this time of year is dehydration. And, but which metaldehyde will do that to an animal. It will dehydrate them. But when they do the test, they never find any residue in the, or, you know, the blood test, they never find any residue of metaldehyde poisoning in the animal. So I want to say it can in large quantities, but what little bit we put out that, that animal would have to eat a lot. And I mean, quite a bit. Okay, great. Uh, we've got a couple more questions coming in too. Uh, the next one is what has been the cost of the program from 2011 through 2023? Well, that's a good question. I've got several numbers here. I'm gonna give you the high number. It was uh, last I saw was 22 million. Um, so another question, are the canines trained only for snail detection or for other problems as well? The canines we use are USDA dogs. They are rescued and trained in Georgia at a facility in Georgia for giant African land snails only, but they can be cross-trained for other pests as well. And they're highly trained to not to uh, engage in other dogs or cats or any other animals on the property. So they do 10 weeks of training for snails only. But when those dogs are no longer, I want to say retired, they go back to the facility and adopt it out to a, to a family or home that wants them. Cool. Um, I, John Herbert, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, um, I've got a question about the, the slide that showed, I think it was Red and gray progressing to yellow to green to blue. Mm -hmm. So if if you, I, I see treatments on red, gray, and yellow, with no treatments after that. If you if you progress through and you're 
in the blue phase and you see a detection, does that kick you back to a lower hierarchy or how does that work? Okay. And I'm glad you asked that because it, this is, this is the chart that gives me heartburn every time we go to the table. So what you're seeing now, when after these properties go from yellow to green, there is no treatment. So, and there's no treatment in blue. So what, let's say that property was within a month of being eradicated and we find a dead snow with flesh in it, it reverts back to either red or gray, depending on where that location of the property is. So red is positive. Any property around red is automatically gray. If that makes sense. Um, so even if it's green and we find a live snail, it reverts back to red and starts the process completely over. Now we can do that for one property or we can do it for that property and the properties next to it. It depends on how big the snail is and how many we find. So there's, okay. there's several people that help make that decision. It's just not on me or Cali. It's, it, it, it goes through a process so we can make, a wise decision and try to keep the cost down and less impact on the uh, property owner or tenant. Thank you. So another question on that slide, um, does the timing of the night survey and the detector dog survey matter? Are those at the very end or do they happen anytime in your time frame? We usually do both throughout the program, but they really don't count until after they go green or blue. And the timing, Depends on the time of year. So I'll be doing an evening survey next week in Pasco with my, I got like uh, 13 people coming in for that. So what we'll do, we contact all the county commissioners, the mayors, the sheriff's department, city police, anybody that we need to, to let them know we're going to be in these neighborhoods. We try to reach out to all the tenants, all the homeowners, apartment complexes, businesses that are involved and let them know from five o'clock to nine o'clock. We plan to do an evening survey on your property. And if they have, if I say they can't be there, we'll ask them what night's best for them and we'll come back or if the weekend's better. But 99% of the time we can get on every property as long as we give them enough notice. And uh, in that way, let's say there's a homeowner that wasn't home and we went there and then they come home and see us there and they call the police, at least the police and the commissioners and the mayors are alerted that ahead of time that we, we are there and that, Hopefully, you know, nobody gets, gets injured, you know, from, from being startled. So, but we, we do our best to, to uh, educate the neighborhood on what we're doing. Sounds like a very intensive program. It, it's, it's very time consuming. Even when I'm on vacation, I'm getting calls throughout the day and it's not, but it's, it's not that I can't walk away from it. I just don't want any problems arising and uh, I'd rather have it fixed and taken care of than somebody else have to deal with a problem that they may not be aware of or know how to handle. Do we have any more questions from the participants? Like I said, there's my cell phone and my email. Feel free to call anytime. If I don't answer, leave me a voicemail and I will get back to you. Awesome. 